Uh, I should have a bit of carrot cake. Do you like carrot cake? I actually do. I don't mind carrot cake because it's not as sweet. You know, I hate sweets generally. I'm such a health nut and it, I don't find it as dense, you know? Yep. Just light. But, just goes just goes down. I bought these sort of carrot cake fingers. They're unbelievable. Unbelievable <laughs> stuff. Still thinking about them. Uh, welcome back to the, the kind what? of book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on. What's the red drink that you that you drink lately? Is this is, is a- squash? This is squash. I have this. It's like a. I don't know why, but every single kind of podcast I'm drinking a squash. It's like a sort of when I'm recording a podcast, I have a, I have a drink. But I like it like really light, like almost like flavored water. Okay. Okay. People, so people like in the comments, lot- people in the comments will be fuming at that. That is that is my squash. That's what. That's how I like it. I don't want. I don't want none of this. You know strong squash none of it <laughs> none of it anyway welcome back to oh no sorry yes guys welcome back to the kind of podcast uh george and i here today for a big one to talk about um the brighton game to preview the buying game um i'm obviously going to talk about uh what else we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the sort of the the fringe members of the squad but first before we do that george how are you and i realize we haven't spoke about this on the podcast in a while how are the wedding plans going Mm. When's my invite <laughs> good. coming? They're good. Come They're on. good. They're um, it's a it's a lot of work. A lot of work. The shock horror of being an adult is more than you expect. I yep. Mean, with yep. everything, you know, you kind of do the whole proposal thing, and then all of a sudden you say, "Okay, we're gonna have to start planning." And those plans are like a lot. You start talking about who's invited. That's been a whole thing. Yeah. Me. And so. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. And uh, and also just realizing what the heck you have to get ready, like. Who knew napkins had to be planned and like <laughs> cutlery and like, I'm like, just pick a fork. It's a fork. You're eating, right? Like there has to be a design and there's a whole thing. So I am learning. Have you learning? Have learning you had patience. any kind of discussions about napkins that have, have got a bit tense and you're like, why am I, ha- why am I having an argument about a spoon here? What's going on? <laughs> I've learned, mate. You know what? This is a budget. You play within it. I will say yes to whatever you need, and that's and that's I think marriage. <laughs> I love it. You're playing the sort of the Stan Kroenke role. <laughs> yes. Here's yes. the budget. Here's the budget. Who's, you do what you want who, within it. <laughs> oh my gosh, who's who's our who's our financier? Tim Lewis. I'm the Tim Lewis of the wedding. Yes. At this point. Yeah. Love it. Love it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just just ensuring checks and balances. Maybe getting rid of yeah. rid of a couple or else. And yeah, he's yeah yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. You he's want a record invited. bid? Okay. You, is that going to the flowers? Is that going to the photographer? You got to decide. You know. It's all about fund allocation, yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah. It's all fund allocation. This is important stuff. She's got to learn. She's got to learn. Uh, yes. Anyway, we should move forward to the football. Um, Brighton uh, 3-0 mm. felt like a fairly comfortable victory in the end although I, I appreciate actually we were t- talking the interaction weren't we that you felt it was a more sort of fluid performance than I did watching mm. it back on match of the day that night I think there was you know I was watching it going oh, maybe George was right but I think actually when I really and then I went back and watched the full game there was a you know we can look at a number of stats. There was final third entries and possession numbers and field tilt, which were only won by point one. George, um, <laughs> I felt it was a more even contest, and I'll come to sort of uh, why I felt that. But you you felt it was a, a much more fluid performance, and you were you seemed happy with it, which makes me yeah. Happy, I I felt like the first fifteen minutes were um, bright in potential, but I just never thought that they troubled our goal they really never troubled um with a dangerous shot on target they may have had possession and they may have been able to work really good moments in terms of arriving in the final third but once again arsenal restrict the opposition to minimal shots on target minimal shots in the box minimal touches in the box and so for me it's possession but it's not dangerous possession and we look comfortable so i mean in a sense sure i saw the possession and field tilt will reflect that because they're in the final third but um I almost hope that we could get another metric next to field tilt and talk about touches in the box. Absolutely not. Right next to it. Because <laughs> you know, like um, I've, I've been, you know, thinking a lot lately about, you know, what is the good way to play football? Because Arsenal have been critiqued for the last couple of weeks for so many uh, things, so many hurdles that we have to jump through. And this new hurdle has been defensive football and how do we quantify what's good and what's entertaining. And, you know, when people quote the Manchester Cities and the Liverpools and whatnot, I'd be very interested to see because Arsenal come out on touches in the box. So, I mean, are you talking, I like to see basketball games Mm. and that's the entertainment? 
Because if you're talking from, I guess, an objective standpoint about trying to hurt your opposition, ultimately, however you arrive in the final third, it needs to end with you in the box. It needs to end with you having your dangerous players taking shots on target that, for example, are in the box and not restricted to outside the box to poor chances. That, for me, would be an objectively good attack and entertaining. And I'm just finding, you know, I, I relate it to the Brighton game because I think a lot of that came into play where my fluid comments came. A lot of our passing patterns resulted with times and touches in the box, whereas Brighton's moments of fluidity resulted in times that they were outside the 18-yard box. And there was very little time, and we restricted them probably only to the Enciso chance, which, again, was outside the box and just a brilliant moment mm -hmm. of individual brilliance in a sense uh, when he goes for a great shot but other than that I never felt worried about Brighton being able to penetrate our our penalty box I never yeah. felt as yeah. though there was a there was a worry in that sense so that's where I, I think my fluidity came in and of course I will end on I think Jesus had a really good game um, you know I, I was frustrated at times because I felt as though he was overdoing it but I think there's a there's a part of every single squad that is trying to do that because they're seeing the run and they're seeing the importance. And we'll have a talk about it a little bit later. But people are seeing how brilliant we are, mate, and they want to play. And so I think there's a level of people trying things, maybe more than they should, to impress. Because you have to, to get into this 11. And there is that pressure now that I don't think was quite there last year. We had a squad, but I don't think the squad felt the pressure last year. There was almost an acceptance. The 11 won't change. That's it. But yep. we've seen a willingness for Mikel to do so. So I think there's that added pressure of performance, but also exceptional performance. I need to stand out to even stand a chance. Yeah. Maybe we should come to Jesus in a minute as one of the individuals that we'll discuss, because I've got a few thoughts about him. I think, um, yeah, on the fluidity thing, yeah, I guess it depends on your definition of fluidity. I think I think the, the, the point you make about stats and... Yeah, touches in the box because yeah, Brighton entered our final third a lot. They were they were there. Um, they and managed to sort of you know construct some some play in there. But did they ever threaten? Did they ever really get into to, to dangerous zones? Did they ever get any really dangerous shots off? You look at the XG in terms of the quality of the chances. It, it wasn't like that. I suppose for me, fluidity means more you know constructing interior play and sort of looking you know really fluid and and kind of how you know how you move through teams. I suppose, but actually. It's, that sort of brings me on to why I think Arsenal were so good in that game is that I think what we see is a continual development and, and, and mm -hmm. new faces every single week of what this team is. Mikel Arteta has gotten into, into a position where I genuinely hand on heart believe that in if you added up every phase of football, throw-ins, playing out from the back, build-up structures, uh, counter-press, uh, set pieces, anything you want to throw at, I'm not saying we're the best in every one, but as an average, we are the best, I think, possibly in Europe in terms of mm -hmm. maximising every single phase of football. Doesn't mean we're going to win the league, doesn't mean we're going to win the Champions League, but I'm saying in terms of, you know, Jorginho spoke about it in an interview a while ago and he said, if there's a phase of football in, in uh, you know, the, for, for Arsenal, Mikel has thought about it. If there's a moment in a game, Mikel has thought about how we maximise it. And that level of ruthlessness in terms of how you approach detail is so important. And that's what I thought we saw, again, against Brighton. We're trying to play on the last line. Okay, Brighton dropped back a little bit. It doesn't quite work. Okay, well, we're going to start, you know, being a little bit more sort of less predictable in build-up and, and maybe baiting you on a little bit more to create that space. Okay, they're packing the midfield. Let's let's try and work it wide. We're going to pull our wingers back a little bit. Whatever Brighton did, because by the way, Brighton are brilliant at that as well. It's one of their strengths, mm -hmm. is adapting to how a team are playing. We have a new way we have a, a different way of, of coming at you and saying, okay, well, we're going to drop Erdogan back in and pull that around. I just think the the faces we're showing as a team is so, so impressive. I, I, it's it's one of my favourite things about Arsenal at the minute. I, I th And I think it's coming down to the players learning positional systems. We went through a little bit of the last video talking about phases, and I think it gets a lot of flack, but there really genuinely is a point of learning that every squad, every person does in life. I mean, you get this idea... Uh, of being told how to perform mathematics, how to perform English. And, you know, I, your life experience dictates how you end up speaking, how you end up using those concepts in real life. You don't constantly refer to the rule book about what bed mass helped you with. You know, you start to... to Bod to mass where of, I come from, mate. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. The international waters one. Yeah, um, and, yeah. 
and and I think you use those as a base layer though like your initial schooling is a base layer for how you're going to perform in real life and how you're going to apply those concepts and that that is what this squad is doing and I think of course Mikel gives us a game plan and I think he's really important to it but I'm noticing a level of individuals adding their own flair to it mm. and the concepts are almost the background noise and we yes. rely upon them in in times when maybe the plan doesn't go correctly but in terms of you know us adapting mid game and adding certain things the players are no longer looking to their cheat sheets before the test saying oh gosh okay in this zone what do i have to do and i think that level of comfortability has allowed for a little bit of relationism a little bit of concepts that we talked about on the tactical terms little shameless plug but it, it allows for that kind of freedom and, and i think we're seeing that in terms of bright and mate like the one thing that i wanted to end on with kind of the analysis of that game was okay i don't think people understand how brilliant it was to walk away with for me it was a very comfortable win a 3-0 win against an opponent who hadn't lost since august at the amex against a team that Let's have it right. Without injuries, should be battling for the Champions League places. Yep. They're already in the top spots of Europe, having not had Sully March for a significant amount of time, and CISO, by the way, who Ferguson. had just come come back. Really, you know, Ansu Fati was injured as well. They, they've had horrendous injuries, and I'm missing a bunch. Matoma wasn't there. Like, um, you know, Evan Ferguson's injured as well. Like, they have a lot of serious talent that is stopping them from being able to compete this season. But yep. they still have. They still have been able to do that, and they're not a bad team. They're everybody's, every top six's potential banana skin would probably have Brighton as one of the teams yeah. that are there, and yeah. it's not been an easy time for a lot of people, and I, I just felt, felt really that Arsenal went to that game with a game plan in mind. It was clinical, and I'm just, I, I've used this word a lot lately in podcasts, clinical and maturity. I feel, I feel the boys, they're not feeling the effects of the run-in. I almost felt like last year, each game was a willing emotional drain. And, you know, I do know that Gary Neville had got a lot of flack for it. But on self-reflection, I do look back at some of those games and not just fans, but the players looked as though there was a lot of emotional battery given to each game. And, you know, these games now, it's almost a clinical, yeah, we're just going to be able to go out and do this and we're going to play our game and it's going to go a particular way. And then we move on to the next one because I don't know, mate, we've had a couple of games back to back that really emulated our run in of last year. Southampton, Liverpool, West Ham, Luton, um, Brighton, Bayern. There's there's a level of similarity here. And the way we've dispatched their performances is in stark contrast, pending Bayern, of course. But I, I, I just feel different. It feels different. And when we talk about the run-in, I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit later after we finish this Brighton post-match, I think things feel different in addition to the metrics telling you it's different. I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, just to pick up on a couple of things from what you were saying, I think the... It's, it's funny, one of the things that's developing in my view, and actually I think he's developing for Arteta. Certainly I haven't heard him speak in, in these terms as he keeps mentioning the players. It's something Pep's talking about a lot at the minute, just is sort of you know putting it back onto the players and saying in the end it's it's the players that make the difference. And I agree, it's that they're not looking at the cheat sheet. Are we seeing Mikel offer as many instructions from the touchline anymore? So mm. Sometimes, you know, so obviously it's funny i think sometimes we look back and realize things that we used to note and used to complain about and we don't in the present day and that can tell us something and we used to you know we always talked about how much Mikel is gesticulating and angry on the touchline and doing this that, and the other and i think there is a level now where the likes of ben white and the likes of bakayo saka and the likes of you know, these guys they've been playing under this guy for three four years you know for in, in some cases longer you know, so they are understanding what he wants. They understand in every phase of play, what's my role? Where do I need to stand? What do I need to do? And then not only on top of that, which is what you're saying, that fades into the background. What's this game demanding? How can I, within that structure, within that level, what's my freedom within there? Um, and yeah, maybe it comes on to, we'll come to some individuals in a second. Uh, maybe that comes to, to Jesus uh, in terms of where that individual freedom versus the, the sort of being rigid within a structure falls for him. 
But yeah, I also agree on the Brighton stuff in, in terms of, I think De Zerbi would be a fantastic Man United manager. I really do. I think someone said that. I can't remember who um, said that. A couple of people on, on, on the old X. But I think he would be a brilliant Man United manager. I think he fits in every single metric for them. I think he'd be perfect. And I really hope they don't get him because he is he's extraordinary. He's a really, really top manager uh, in many different ways. Um, but yeah, let, maybe, maybe let's come on to some individuals before we move on to uh, the buying game. Um, let's do Jesus because I feel in some ways maybe he's at the point in his Arsenal career where he got to with Man City, where we are competing at that level with Man City. I'm not saying we're the same club. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, and I'm not saying, and I'm not saying, but we are, you know, you look at the metrics, you look at the numbers, we're competing with them, we're ahead of them in the table, right? Have we got to the point with Jesus where I feel there is that desire to, to impress a little bit, but I also feel there's a lack of, predictability with Jesus that goes beyond what we need right now. I think with Saka, there's a level of unpredictability to his game in terms of what he does. And I think sometimes he, he could exploit that even further. But, but there's know, reliability in possession. Th- but there's reliability in possession and out of possession. You know exactly what you're getting. You know you're getting progressive passes. You know you're getting progressive carries. You know you're getting um, progressive receive numbers. You know you're getting that wide wide channel receiver over there. With Martinelli, you know, it's different, but you know you're getting the pressing numbers. You know you're getting that sort of inside the, the centre-back and the full-back. With Jesus, and, and this is my question... I don't always know what I'm getting from him, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think it slightly destabilizes our front five, I would argue. And um, yeah, I, I don't know whether that's what Arteta wants. It's, um, I think it's really a general general debate on Mavericks as a whole in football, yep. isn't it? Because, I mean, you can also throw in Zachenko there in a little bit. I mean, look, he's brilliant to a certain extent, but you also don't know exactly what he's going to do and this idea of i don't know is there a hazard that can come up into football nowadays and be acceptable in positional systems um and it's not to say that you know positional systems have to be the end all be all and gold standard because there's places for mavericks um but this idea of mavericks in football is it dying in a certain degree look i i I do think there is a certain level of control the word is control Right. And right now, coaches have realized that people and athletic progress has been so great that teams look to exert the maximal amount of control. And that's through rigid positioning. That's through positional systems, making sure that you're in a particular zone, however many players are in a particular zone. I can assure you, Arsene Wenger, for example, is not coaching that. He's not coaching that way. And, you know, I think Cesc Fabregas had kind of made a mention about it in certain interviews in terms of talking about how he doesn't like the current modern day of football in terms of that. It's tough for me to say because I really, as a as any kind of coach, you have a philosophy about what you believe in to win. You have to be rigid in that, right? And I think, at least from my sense, I never reject one concept as totally into one spectrum. I believe that there's a time and place for both because I feel that there's always a time when the game asks for so many different things that you need to be open to it. And so with Jesus, he's a kind of player that um, I think on a whole, his package is really enticing. He's a very physical player. For his size, he can hold off people much larger than himself. He has a level of burst and agility within tight spaces that very few players in the world have. And I think for all of his dribbling, which I mean, people want to critique his decision making when to become direct, he does have a level of elite dribbling ability that is Mm. few and far between in the world. And he knows it as well. So he knows that nine times out of 10, I'm going to beat the man. But I want to go back, turn and beat him again just to show that I can do it. That's the part that I think is coaching Mm. tweaks in terms of, okay, I want you to use it. I want you to use your chaos, but in a, in a, in a way that's controlled chaos. And, you know, that, that's something that, you know, in life we try to look for and just in general. Yeah. And I think that you're going to have to try to rein in the stallion in a sense. And yeah. that's no, going to be I, a case. I agree. I agree. And I think it, you're right to, to bring up the sort of the co- that conversation between 
order and chaos. It's, you know, it's, 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 it goes beyond football. It's, you know, okay, I've got this plan for my day, but if something comes along that, you know, mm-hmm. is going to change my life, you know, I can't just go, well, I've got this plan for the day. And I said, I'd do this thing at two o'clock and that's it. You know, things happen, you know, it, it, but, but it's that, it's, it's getting that balance right. And I think it, uh, at the moment in the Premier League, the, the tone setter is Pep. And because that's his kind of style of play, I think I maybe where to beat that, to beat this and win in this league right now, it's Arteta. But and and maybe I would fall. It would it's it's that sort of style of football which Arteta plays is my point. And then you watch that game Liverpool and United, and it's obviously more interesting for the neutral. But that's another side of it. You know, I, I think I actually think Ten Hag maybe would say that he's on the more side of trying to control games. But mate, this guy is struggling to implement that certainly at the moment. Can I ask you actually, because I think Ten Hag is a brilliant example of the other end of the spectrum that he tries to go for positional system, but it ends up becoming an incredibly transitional game. He allows more shots on target than Sheffield. For you, entertainment, what is entertainment? Like, can we define that? Because, I mean, we're starting to say what's good and bad on an individual level from entertainment. And then we talk about teams like, Obviously, for the neutral, I'm not going to act obtuse. You look at some of those games and you're like, haha, that's amazing. Look at how many transition moments we see. But if that was your team and you were seeing that every week, okay, and you were in a position where United are, where they're just flirting with top four, okay, they're in, they're out. Is that entertainment enough for you to say, that's the football I want to play? Well, it's it's it, it's perfect for Sky Sports. That's what it is. It's perfect. For, it's perfect to sell packages. It's perfect for for to sell you know the sort of the brand of the Premier League. But if you're looking to win in this league, which to me is the entertaining part, <laughs> like you know, and th- this is the thing: you can win in a stale way. But you know, are Arsenal stale? Oh, are we stale? I don't think we are. I think what we are is control. But control doesn't mean stale and boring. It's similar to sometimes people, I think this is a kind of a wider point. Sometimes people, you're accused of not taking something seriously if you're joking. Mm-hmm. So it's not the same thing. I can take something seriously and also and also see the funny side in something. Taking something seriously doesn't have to be really solemn and really downbeat. And you can take something seriously and be up upbeat, right? Mm-hmm. It's 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 not the same thing. So we have to be specific about what we mean. Control is not boring. Control means you can create however many chances you can play. You can play in many, many different ways. So for me, that is entertaining. That winning and seeing different sides of your game. However, I accept that I am the individual, right? I, I'm an individual who believes in that. If I'm a neutral watching Man United v, v Liverpool, it's much more entertaining to watch that type of football. But for a coach going into a club, for me, from what I would do as a coach, you know, going in there, maybe throw back to you and see what you think. I want to control every aspect of the game. I want to, maybe that's because I've, you know, come through in my sort of football analysis really with, you know, with Arteta and and Pep and so on and so forth. And those are the guys that I look at. But also Klopp is, I I always describe it like playing on the edge of the game, which could be, some some people might love, if you believe you can, you can always beat teams by having a moment. And we'll come to this in in the Bayern preview. How do we, how do you do that? Does that win you other types of games? And does that win you the sort of the elusive games where you can just corner taken quickly yourself to prizes? I think it's less sustainable, which is what I say with Liverpool, but I appreciate that that is a a methodology that you could look at. Yeah, I I think that you're going to be pushed to your limits because you only question your philosophy when it's not going right. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, and that's when your belief comes in, both as a coach and as an individual. And um, everyone's different. I would say as a coach, generally, I'm more pragmatic. As a philosophy, I truly believe, you know, if... You're the Canadian Tony Pulis is what you're saying. (laughs) Exactly. But I I, I fundamentally (laughs) believe you stop people from scoring, you get a point. If you allow people to score, you will lose points at its base core. And Big Sam. (laughs) <laughs> well, exactly. Deutsch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Move over. I'm the next. You know. um, Get him in. Save Everton's season. Another two <laughs> points gone. Get George in. <laughs> Get him in the trench coat. <laughs> but, but but that's me, for example. And I would say somebody like Arsene Wenger, who again is my football idol, I keep saying, it isn't that philosophy. He He, for example, the way a pass is made, he finds beauty in it. It's not, do you win or do you lose? But it's, 
okay, has has that player who has never played that pass before been able to play that pass in that moment? That for him is joy. That and yep. who am I to say what's right and what's wrong on that spectrum, right? And I don't think anybody can say that. The one thing I will say to retain and kind of relate this entertainment aspect is I almost relate the United Games to Jersey Shore trash TV. Okay. <laughs> it's like Love it, Island. It is Love or Island Love football. Island for, I yeah, guess, Love Island football. Right? Like brilliant TV in its niche, but trash. Like we yeah. all accept it's horrible, <laughs> but we all love it. Right. And it is entertaining. It is entertaining, but yeah. it's not in that cinema. unhinged way. Yeah, yeah, yes. no, it's you're so right. You're and, so right. And so when you see a level of you know the way that we play, I do believe there's an Oscar level cinema about it's it. Christopher Nolan. It's Oppenheimer but, football. But United yeah. and Eric Ten Hag, Love Island will never make it to best in class, best supporting actress, and that's okay. They're in their niche, but there is a level of difference. Like you don't. You don't see TV critics going to say, wow, Love Island, that's an interesting story with Molly in terms of what she's doing with Brad. And, <laughs> you know, it's it's not the same level of scrutiny yeah. and evaluation. So I guess where, where I come to is, yes, it's entertainment. But on the scale of what's important here, I think that entertaining is a factor. It's a thread in the bow. And yeah. you obviously need to be able to support it with objectively good performances and that comes from uh some of the metrics that we can see some of the winning that we're able to continuously do and also in terms of the level of control you're able to exert and i think control can be done in different ways out of possession in possession those are all threads but if you blend those three i feel that you're a successful team if yeah. you just have one of those things you're molly may you're molly may <laughs> Tommy, <laughs> Tommy, uh, <laughs> we will do this Bayern preview and we will uh, come to maybe the title race at some point. <laughs> this is going to be an hour and a half. Babs isn't here to control us. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, I do want to come on to one more individual from the from the Brighton game before we move on. And that is Kai Havertz, um, mm. who we're seeing. Yeah, just I think. And I think maybe the angle that I want to take on this is... It just, we're already having conversations and I, we won't go down this road because then we will end up in a two-hour podcast. Um, uh, the I'm talking about Rashford at the minute and I quite like the Rashford idea and I've got this sort of that sort of bit between my teeth. But a lot of that, I'm thinking back to what we thought about Kai Havertz last summer and what we were saying about him, that he's lazy out of possession, that he's past it, that he's you know not in the right environment and how key in, environments are, I guess, is the angle I want to take on this. How key... Do you think to Havertz's success is his environment, or how much you put it down to the individual? Because I, I, for me, we exist in, in such a culture of everyone is an individual, everyone is looking out for themselves, everyone is I'm it's everything is for me. If you fail, it's only your fault. If you succeed, it's only your fault. And for me, I think the environment from from some people's perspectives, and I think the environment is king. The environment is absolutely king in football. And this is a point I'm sort of trying to stress at the moment to get some sort of good analysis around. Um, but yeah, I, for me, I think the environment that we've created around Kai Havertz is allowing him to flourish. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Kai Havertz is a evidence of that. It's a support of that theory, right? And I think it's a bit of chicken and egg if I really try to take a philosoph philosophical like perspective on it. Because I mean... Who's to say that, you know, an environment in terms of somebody that doesn't have the same advantages of you can't be successful. I mean, there's moments where that can be, but I'm not dumb to say on in general, people with that environment don't succeed in general. There are instances of people being able to go out. That's the beauty of life. There are exceptions. And they're held up in. as, look, they did it. So why can't you? Even though well, they're one in a million. <laughs> well, exactly. And so there are, there are outliers to every theory to it. I do think in this in today's game, though, because positional football and tactics are such a major component of the way that we digest football and the way that we succeed in football, that the environment has to supersede the individual. And it kind of it's actually a brilliant transition from our other conversation from Mavericks, right? Like it's it actually supports that theory because we don't see as many Eden Hazards in today's game. And that's for me 
because of that idea about individuals versus environment, which plays more. And right now we're in a period of football where the era and the team have a higher level of importance than the individual, in my opinion. And so from that perspective, I think you have to acknowledge that there's a level of individual grit that Kai Havertz has shown and the mentality to kind of uh, absolutely ignore all of the detractions, which has been huge, by the way. And and I don't, that's the one thing I talk about Kai Havertz where I don't, I don't think we talk about his mental strength enough. Um, it's absolutely at the elite level, the elite level. And the reason I say that is because can you, can you bottle what was said about Kai Havertz last summer? Not just from rival fans. Let's just take Arsenal fans in general. We've made a pedantic cheer of the 60 million pounds down the drain. And we're looking at right now, what's he on? 14 goal and assist season? Where No one has got more GA in the league since the middle of February. Sure. And, and you're talking with how many games that are left. It's very feasible that we're looking at a 15 to 20 goal a season player right now. And, and you're sitting there scratching yourself. Is that worth 60 million pounds? Well, of course. And... So, which was our question at the beginning? Of the, that was our question. We were having six months ago on the pod, hundred percent, absolutely. And and so there is a level, and we were having these debates: is he aggressive enough in his actions? Is he really putting the component? Like there are individual moments, but then are we platforming him in the right way? Is the left central midfield a way to really make sure that we accentuate his qualities? No, the center forward position is. So there there are definitely levels of individual improvement that you have to weigh on one hand, and there's definitely levels where we've had him in a structure at the center forward position, by the way, that make him able to shine enough with these qualities. Now, um, look, I, I want to give praise, but I do think Arsenal, I don't think Kai Havertz does this at Real Madrid. I don't think Kai Havertz does this at PSG. He didn't do it at Chelsea. I don't think he does it at United. I, I even don't think he does it under Pep as well. Um, I think we've seen how Pep and his history with Mavericks hasn't been bright necessarily. So there is a level for me, at least, of environment rolling king here um, in terms of what Mikel has been able to offer and what this team has been able to offer. Because really, if you actually think about it, mate, our team has been a healer for many Island of Misfit toys across Mikel's tenure. Marcus, Rashford, it hasn't just been Marcus, Kai Havertz. <laughs> so, I mean, in a sense, it's funny because people are going to look at not just Kai Havertz, but I think Gabrielle is a more brilliant example, personally. Um Many people considered him a bozo <laughs> in rude terms, you know, in terms of, okay, look, he's a good center back, but he will never be elite, yep. right? And that tag has actually lived with him now unfairly. He's been elite for over a year now. Since November of last year, he's been utterly elite. And there's conversation that has to be had about him being one of the best center backs in the world, simply. Now, but mate, to go from what he was, he was a very unorthodox gate, somebody that looked weird in possession, clunky, a warrior, but also just overly aggressive. Is he Mustafi or is he something else? And that option, by the way, of something else was got very two little. as a sense of back. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think we've done it before, I guess is my point. We have a pattern of yep. fixing things yep. that seem unfixable. Yep. So I think uh, there has to be a level of environment is key here. Yeah. But Kai has done a lot. He has done a lot and we can't ignore that. I, no, I, no, I, I, and I wouldn't ignore it at all. I think it's a massive part of it. I just think for me, when you look at the goals he scored, so many of them, it's not, you know, this isn't a criticism, but they're system goals in a sense. They are the cutbacks from from a wide player to for him being in the right position at the right time and the way we crash the box the way we the way we build the way we build up the the fact that he can stand on the last line and create those runs to, to make that space for the, the players in the middle to, to to play I think his his effectiveness is all coming for me not all a lot of it is coming from uh, the environment the system we, we, we put him in but we're hoping ready for this that he can do the same on Tuesday night the crowd, crowd, crowd goes well. Crowd goes well. Uh, Arsenal are playing Bayern München tomorrow night. Uh, when we record this is on Monday, uh, on Tuesday the 9th. Um, it's a huge, huge fixture. How are you feeling about being in this conversation again? Not to be, you know, philosophical and emotional again, but genuinely, like, I'm looking at that fixture, mate. I've done it so many times on my phone. I don't know how many people have at home. I'm reading the kickoff time and yeah. I'm like, Bayern Munich. It's Bayern Munich. Like, it's it's big, it's isn't it? It's absolutely huge. 
it's absolutely huge. And, and these are these are the fogging conversations, as Mikel might say, <laughs> that we want to be in. You know, that I think, yeah, we, we get caught up in the moment. We, we talk players and concepts and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, what you have to, of course, also be able to take a step back and go, just consider, <laughs> I tweeted this out the other day, Spurs aren't in Europe. Chelsea are rubbish. United are rubbish. Klopp's leaving. City are going to get relegated. We're top of the league with seven to go. And we're facing Bayern in the quarterfinals of the Champions League with a good chance. Are we dreaming? Like, imagine, imagine when you and I met, what was it, a couple of years ago, saying that to each other. That that's going to yeah. be happening in April 2024. Like, you know, of course you project forward and you dream, but there's a million dreams, not to sound like I'm going to start singing, a million dreams. Um, but, you know, there's a million dreams of every football <laughs> fan and every football club in the land. There's only one or two who get to do it every season. Yeah. And we are that club. So it's, mate, it, we are in such a privileged position. I, I think maybe the thing I want to lean on here as a kind of overall conversation, is Mikel talks about this, and I completely agree. You know, people ask him always in press conferences and so on about pressure and about, you know, are you feeling the pressure of this game or whatever? And he always says something, and I love it. It's like, it's a beautiful opportunity. Like, you can you can think about it as pressure if you want. It's up to you. But why, why aren't we saying, these are the moments. This is a beautiful opportunity for us to go out and say, look, here we are. This is This is the Arsenal team that, you know, we all wanted to become. So why are we, you know, overloaded with fear? Now I have a question. I have questions about the game and and sort of how it will go, but in terms of the occasion overall, this is a beautiful, beautiful opportunity, and uh, hopefully we can enjoy the moment. I just think it's part of making history, mate. Like you look at some of these nights, and these are what give you the opportunity to make history, right? And that that's the level of importance that it is. You know, you not to be crude, but you don't make it for beating Luden, and there's a reason for it. And when you're writing the history of a club and you're writing the the power, that aura that that type of club has, it's about exerting its influence over these types of teams. And I, I, I'm beyond excited for the night. I think that it's been long overdue. Uh, this team has been through a journey and a process that um, <laughs> makes these nights beautiful. And so I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. Um, I'm excited for it and I can't wait to get into the tactics because I actually think it's a brilliant game to analyze and um, it's a chance for by the way Bayern to rescue their season by yep. the way and yep. and I think that's really important because the league's gone that's the first time they've been able to say that in how many years they're in a yep. state of turmoil and it does it does leave a wounded animal and they're dangerous they're I, I think people forget what Bayern are and even this Bayern team, because a lot of players have come back and um, they have danger. They're not without uh, threat. And just because their league performance has been on a bit of a downturn in a one-off game, you have to analyze the individuals, actually, not the team. You can't go based on league form. That stuff gets thrown out the window in these Champions League rounds. And I think that's what makes it so exciting, but also so fearful, because you're starting to talk about winning those 1v1 matchups. And who can do that consistently will win the game. And that's a question that yeah. you can't be confident in until you're sitting there on the night of. And yeah. that's that's the jeopardy. That's the beauty of the Champions League. Yeah. I think yeah, there's some, something about, you know, this this stage of competitions, and especially playing a fixture, let's call it, over two legs. There's a different way. You can't impose yourself in the same way. You know, teams don't set up in the same way. There's a there's a there's a, a sense of urgency to games. And there's not that sense of, oh, you know, well, you know, we've got them this weekend or, you know, well, we, we you know, Luton coming coming up against Arsenal uh, as, as kind of your reference. They're not going, this is do or die. You know, mm -hmm. this, is, this is save our season time. So they're not going to set up in that way. They're not going to they're not going to say, come to Arsenal and say our, our, our season is going to is going to be based on what happens against Arsenal at the Emirates tonight. It's going to be based on what happens against Bournemouth. Which, mm -hmm. which you could see there was a level of fight and, and aggression. And then a game becomes, you know, as you say, the, the sort of 1v1 stuff. And I think Bayern are so set up for those types of games. They have those moments players, which I, again, I think in terms of the next stage of Arsenal, the next development of Arsenal, and not to keep banging the drum, but, you know, one of the one of my things about Rashford, but anyone, you know, whoever, whoever we sign, forget that, is are we going to get someone who can pull out that De Bruyne moment? 
can have a moment, like even like Bruno Fernandes, who played horrendously and just latched onto a ball and gave you a moment, who you go into a game going, I think they're going to be the guy. In the same way that, you know, the Real Madrid can with Bellingham, in the same way that City can with De Bruyne. We're developing that. And it's a conversation we constantly have on this podcast, right? We're developing it, no doubt. And I think we'll sign something in the summer that that, that, that gives us that even more securely. And I think we can see it coming through. But by and to me, the way they transition, the way the commitment in their defending normally, the commitment in their attacking, the numbers they get forward, the numbers they get back, how they manage things, the individual talent to create those little moments in a game where they might be, and actually I think we will dominate a lot of aspects of play against them, but to create those moments, whether it's a set piece or a, or a, a counter attack or whatever, I think they're so brilliantly set up for that. And that's what I worry about. Um, against Bayern they feel like Champions League specialists and they have a, a point to prove they have individuals that can run and they're a physical team that for me is what can cause a little bit of kryptonite you know ironically if I was to face a team like an Inter Milan an Ngazi who I think are brilliant defensively and in their own right are a great team but stylistically that's a matchup I'd go into saying I'm excited for I, I don't worry as much and this Bayern, the reason that there's jeopardy for us, mate, is let me describe this left-hand side for you. Alfonso Davies, Kingsley Coman, Jamal Musiela, with Harry Kane dropping in. That left-hand side versus, by the way, alternatively, Ben White, William Saliba, Martin Odegaard, Bukayo Saka. You're talking about matchups. Let's get specific. Stop talking in the ether. That is the matchup that wins or loses the game. Mm. whose side comes out on top yep. and um, alternatively whose left hand side for Arsenal and whose right hand side for Bayern can exert influence because it's the weaker side it's the side that's less talked about so can Joshua Kimmich perform at right back because they have no Sasha Bowie and is he and he's been doing it for a couple of weeks and he's a brilliant player in his own right down there but how does Martinelli fare against Joshua Kimmich you know who did a great job against Mbappe. Now, the you know, in, in terms of some individual battles in the midfield, it's why, mate, like I look at Thomas Partey and Declan I can't hide. It has to be that, would, that type pick of part team. Of the way. Yeah, yeah yep. and it, it has to be that part. You know, uh, I, I look at Jorginho and I look at what he's done in the last couple of weeks, by the way. There are Jorginho games, like we said, and I think this game, you talk about what's going to happen in midfield against this Bayern team who for the most part they ignore their double pivot um, because they don't have quality there they've got Pavlovich and they've got you know Goretzka who isn't often playing but when he does he still doesn't exert the influence that Bayern hope they look for an upgrade down there and I think Jamal Musiela is their live wire their maverick in the midfield that can pick up pockets that can definitely unpick a lock but um, they struggle in build-up um, looking at their back line, it's full of athletes. So in terms of controlling transition, I think that they're able to do it. But there's going to be space where Alfonso Davies leaves. There's going to be. Um, you know, I don't think Dayu Upamecano has been in favor lately, and they've been playing Eric Dyer and Mateus DeLitt as the two center backs, which I doubt will continue. Um, I think that we're going to see Kim Min Jae. I think we're going to see Upamecano personally. And... I think that you're going to see Joshua Kimmich in the back, like we said, who inverts. So I think from fullback areas, by the way, again, to be specific, Martinelli and Saka are going to be so important, mate. Like winning that battle from an Arsenal perspective, Davies bombing on, Saka, how do we find him? Joshua Kimmich coming into midfield to help them with their in-possession play. Can we hit Martinelli early on the outlet with David Raya? Can we hit those channels early? Because Bayern don't defend well the wide spaces with these two fullbacks. They've got their own influence. They like to attack and use their fullbacks in a particular way. So can we use it against them? I think those are the battles I'm looking at in general about can we be successful. Um, and from an attacking perspective, I will say Kingsley Coman is my biggest worry. Not Harry Kane, not Sané, not even Musiela, who are all, I mean, especially Musiela, who's a brilliant player. Kingsley Coman, for me, is the live wire Champions League breaker in that squad. And look, who knows how long he's fit for, how much he can do. But whenever that boy plays, he's somebody that destroys plans. He is so electric in his physical capacity to create separation. It's genuinely frightening. And you have to have a plan for controlling that. 
And I'm I glad think you love down... him more than Miles Lewis Kelly. I'm actually, <laughs> I think you actually do. <laughs> look, he's a player that you know. You look at people don't look at, at how many Champions Leagues and you know leagues has been able to win. And look, not a lot of that is because you know he hasn't played as much. He's on great teams, sure, but he has a level of individual quality that frightens me. At the biggest stage, he's the type of player. For example, when it, we look at our squad. Who would you say has the Champions League heritage to go? A lot of people for me would shout Martinelli. Why? There's a reason that type of player shines in these one-off games. It's because outlets reign king in one-off games. And that's not to say Saka's a, no a nobody. They, of course, he's somebody that will have a huge influence on this game. But I just think outlets in the Champions League give you moments. Ronaldo, Messi, David Villa. You know, you look at all the most successful Champions League clubs, outlets have really had a factor on the game. So, uh, yeah, that I think those are the individual moments that we have to win. Like, who, who are you the most afraid for and who do you believe that we can exploit the most on both scales? I think um, in these games, it's all about asking them the right questions. And I think um, I think it's, it's about going where... Do you lean into what do you lean into? What do you lean into? I think is is, is really our question. Do we try? Do I believe that Arteta could could construct a a build up that that could break through Brian's press? Yes, absolutely. Do I believe that we could try and I don't know force them to debate us and you know whatever? I don't know. You know, however Mikel wants to set up. Do I, do I believe? Of course. I think Arteta's record against Tuchel is really good, so I don't actually worry about controlling the match itself and maybe holding on to possession and so on. What I worry about is those individual moments, those 1v1 moments, those moments where, okay, yeah, great, we can have 60% possession and, and play through them and, you know, keep it in the final third and get whatever numbers in the field tilt and great. Doesn't matter if Harry Kane picks up outside the box and whacks it top corner. It, it just doesn't matter. So how do you, so, you know, let's control what we can control, but also look at those those key 1v1 matchups and, and those individual moments, as you say, and, and how do you control Musiela? Etc. I worry about the transition, um, and I would be. It's really difficult. I, I I think there's there's a number of different approaches you could take. I think you could try and blitz them at the Emirates. I think that could be it could be an approach, and then go and sit back and really just try and. Um, I, mean, I won't use that phrase, but you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to say uh, at the uh, be a football. You know what? Sorry, please explain it. <laughs> be a football. You know what? At the other other end, a Mourinho, let's say. Uh, over in the, in the Allianz, um, I worry about Harry Kane and 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 moments and penalties and all that stuff. I worry about you know a, a sixty yard Hollywood pass, all that stuff. So, I, I, I it's 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 going to be a game of of cat and mouse and, and kind of going you know how much do you give, how much do you take. I I I, I think it's yeah. The qu coming back to what I was saying, the question marks. Do I believe we can exploit that space in behind the Davies and and uh, um, and Kimmich or whoever is play, playing right back don't think they have Sasha Bowie absolutely absolutely I also believe we can play through them and, and focus on playing literally through them Not we don't have to go over them too much and literally play through them because I don't think that um, uh, defensively sort of Musiela uh, Goretzka depending on who's playing in there I worry too much about them you know pulling out some mad mid block and stopping every single passing lane I don't, I don't worry about that too much but I do want us to be more careful and consistent with who who's following Harry Kane, who's who's tracking um, Serge Gnabry on the edge of the box when we've got a set piece. It's it's it's, it's things like that that I just go because uh, it, it feels quite inevitable that they have those moments and they are inevitable. We've seen it, so it's really hard. I I, I don't know how I would approach it, and that's I'm lucky I'm not the one who's had to make that decision. Um, but I I would be very impressed if we went for a sort of sort of blitz type mentality uh, at the Emirates I'll be very impressed and I'd love it and I think we could do it but do we have the the you know what to pull that off if Arteta think, does then fair look, play I'll, I'll, I'll put my nuts on the table we have to uh, look f from a certain ex ex expectancy of there are moments there's moments to be pragmatic and there's moments to be offensive okay and I and I think that in general I need to see a man-to-man -man press. I will say this, you know, I, I think that if you're looking at a team that are poor in build-up, and it's not even a matter of 
trying to exert your influence. Like, I'm not even coming from that angle. I'm coming from the angle of what is weak about Bayern, their buildup. And so if I'm going to be zonal, I'm not going to be able to attack a major form of their weakness. And so I think at home, absolutely do that. And the story of the match for me is going to be get one or two goals through your press. Make them nervous. Make them nervous to play at the Emirates. Don't give them time to run. The more possession Bayern have for me, the more character they grow. They're already a team. For as much as they're wounded and why they're dangerous, it's actually good that they're wounded. It means they're hurt. So you need to dent their confidence, at least this is how I would be thinking. And how do I do that? As soon as I let Kimmich on the ball, that for me is going to be a really big story. If I was to let Bayern dictate and actually get out of their buildup, something that they've been questioning the entirety of this season, it gives them confidence. And so I don't want them to have that confidence because they're they're going to have moments, by the way. We're going to have moments where we're questioning our goal. And I think fans need to get comfortable with this. We're not going to have yeah. the dominant Arsenal game where it's just going to be completely blocking shot. And if we do, I'd love to be wrong. That would be incredible yeah, yeah, yeah. to no. pull a, a Brighton on them. But that's not going to be the case, in my opinion. No. So, yeah, I would like to I see that. And on the man for man press, I hear your logic, and I think the denting the confidence thing is is a thing. But also, then it's like you know one Hollywood ball from Upa Meccano to Harry Kane in the route, and this this is you know it's it's kind of that when you have that individual level of quality without the team cohesion, they lean into different things, and and yeah, so it's 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 just going to be. And I'm not saying that that therefore you don't man for man press them. It's just then, then you have to be then aware you go of that. zonal, right? You give yeah, them the yeah. time to find Harry Kane who can exert his influence in the. the there's every for every reaction there's an equal and opposite reaction thank you science that's a line from hamilton and so <laughs> i mean there, there there's going to be look you have to create a plan and like i said i'm glad that we're not in charge i'm gonna be ballsy right. and put what i would put on you know personally like analyzing it from what i see i just think that byron will go long I've maintained this. I think they don't have the confidence for despite, you know, them looking at this as a way to really win their season. I think that they're not confident playing through us. At Arsenal Emirates, could yeah, yeah. yeah. Arsenal could be confident playing through them, but that the same's not the case, you know, on the other foot. And so yeah. they're they're looking at their outlets, they're looking at these stuff. I think Leroy Sané and Kingsley Coman are going to be the wide outlets and they're going to say, "Look, we got to hit these guys early and we got to test those fullback areas because that's where our strength is. Get the ball up there and if we lose it, it's okay. It's deep. Um, if we lose it where we've lost it in traditional areas, they've got one of the best pressing sides in Europe. And I think Tuchel knows that just as much as we do. So it's fun. Let's see what yes. happens. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's do predicted lineup. Um, I think Roy White Saliba is not debatable. The left back for me, Tomiyasu. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think, I think I he's our best lockdown uh, option on that side. Uh, obviously, Kivior is has played really well, but. I think seniority does play a part at some point and, and he has been fantastic. I'm not taking that away from him, but there's just moments in his game that you go, uh, I think Tommy Asu could, could could really bring something. I would, you're going to like this, I would go for a Partey, Odegaard, Rice midfield. I'm sure you'd agree. Absolutely. Because I think especially, you know, in certain moments, if Bayern have transitioned through us, you know, that that gas pedal straight on with Thomas Partey. Also, also defensively, I think there's a solidity to Thomas Partey that, that we, we have missed at times. Uh, and then the front three, if everyone is fit and available, would be Saka Martinelli Havertz for me. No complaints for me. I think you've picked my team that I would like to see. First sub, David Beckham. <laughs> Second sub, uh, it means more. Uh, <laughs> third sub, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer. <laughs> it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. Uh, but we will be back after the buy game for an instant reaction. We'll obviously discuss it for patrons and YouTube members for our exclusive podcast in the middle of the week. Before we finish, George, we wanted to come to, because we had a discussion about Smith Rowe uh, on the last podcast, or one of our last podcasts. And I sort of wanted to go through the team and get a sort of, I guess, a kind of quick overview of where you think each player or how you think each player's running will go outside of the first 11 you know that you know obviously yeah. there'll be players who are a little bit here and there who whether they are on the first 11 but i think there's a couple of players that i'd love to discuss um just yeah just go, to see we go back and forth we each take a player yeah i think we should do that i think we should do that um yeah i i think just to just to kind of get a sense of this because you know the squad is is more playing more and more in my head i think we've got seven games potentially to go in april we're going to need some of these guys. So I think it's worth having a conversation about some of these. So um, 
Why don't you start us off, George? Who would you like me to talk about? I'd love for you to talk about Fabio Vieira. Okay. Uh, I said this in a video for the different knock. Shout out. Plug. <laughs> um, my concern, you know, I, I made a video on that channel in July last year saying I was worried about Vieira. Um, and I'm bringing that up slightly for my ego, of course. But also to say that my issues with Vieira haven't really changed. Um, my question marks are not about him physically at all. I don't worry about his frame. I actually think he's quicker than people give him credit for. I don't worry about his technical level. I don't worry about uh, Vieira from a kind of, um, uh, yeah, a football ability wise. I think there's something there. We've we've seen it. We've seen it happen. A small sample size. I think people slightly overrate the sample. You know, they say, well, look, we saw it against Fulham. It's like, Yes, but there was one moment um, and we need more, but I believe he can do it. My question mark is, we're in the business end of the season. We're in the part of the season when there's millions of pounds on the line. We're in the part of the season where contracts, money <laughs> is is at stake. Reputations are at stake. When Mikel Arteta looks to his left or right, depending on where he stood in technical error, usually out of it, is he going to go, this guy can win me this game? with Fabio Vieira first and always. And at the moment, I just think there are a number of players, Trossard, Partey, Havertz, Jesus, whoever's on the bench, who will come off the bench before Vieira. Now, there is a place for Vieira, but I think, um, and I hope a moment is coming. I think I just feel it. But I just worry about the the kind of that he's himness of Vieira. I'm I'm gonna be short and sweet. Um, he has the best final ball in the squad. When you're talking about moments here, he could provide a moment. You're looking at the player that has that composure in the moment to provide the final pass. I trust Fabio Vieira more than really anyone in the squad to provide the final ball. And when I'm looking at games, I don't think that he'll exert the influence that you want to see, though. And I will end on that because you don't worry about the final moment or the final pass. I think you're no. more worried about a general performance of 90 minutes about being able to exert your influence. Now, that's not something that I'm confident in him doing in the run in because have a look at our fixtures, mate. You're looking at Bayern twice, Villa, Wolves, Chelsea, Tottenham, United, Bournemouth and Everton. Yeah, he's not Bournemouth he's is not potentially <laughs> the one game that you would say, okay, we could go for something different for 90 minutes. The rest of those matches, they're running transition physical matches, and he's just not number one in that pick. Yep. But I do think that he doesn't have to be to prove himself useful in the run-in. It will end on that. I think that that final moment is something that he can do, that final pass, and he does offer us something uniquely different that is impact in terms of output. So for finding a game difficult and it's not going to plan, I actually think Fabio Vieira is one of the first players that Mikel would turn to in terms of, because for me, something not going to plan is a low block nil-nil. We're not winning. Whereas that, and in that scenario, he's one of the tools that you use to unlock it. Yeah, depends on the scenario, but I, I just have to say, I think the 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 feeling in my eyes the 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 look in his eyes the the feeling in my belly all that stuff I think is going to come into play and I yeah I I I hope he has moments I think he has the capacity but the sample size that we have isn't big enough for me and the scenarios where I think that can apply are quite slim so we'll see uh, George I would like you to discuss Reese Nelson oh God I really struggle with this because I I love him. I love what he is. And I love what he could be. I don't see a way that he makes many squads left in the season, let alone moments off the bench. Yeah, and it's kind of been un un underreported that Reese has not been in two squads out of three. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's, again, personally, if you're talking about people that left wing that can command the touchline winger role, I would have him over Trissard um, playing that role. But I wouldn't have him over Trissard in terms of reputation and in terms of his goal and assist numbers per 90. It's, it's unfortunately a situation where I just think that he's actually really grown. He needs to move to a team that lets him be a starter. Um, we have far too many people, Jesus, Trissard, and Martinelli, 
that are best on his side. And then if Sa- if Saka's fit, he's going to play in this run in. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, might seem a rogue one. Oh no! So you go next. Sorry. Um, I want to give you uh, Thomas Partey. I want to give you the ones that we've had some debates on <laughs> in the pod. Uh, I think at the moment with Partey, because of the f- the fitness levels and the sharpness levels, as I see it, I think he's getting back to it. I think he looks a lot better. Um, uh, when he's played over the last couple of games I think um, it's going to be slightly game dependent for a little while 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 he's in that space I think how um, many of those matches that I listed would you say Partey S games are yeah so th- yeah I think there's a there's a time if Partey's fit and firing where like he plays almost every game like for me mm. I think I think almost almost every single game if he's fit and firing but when he's a little bit unsharp as I see at the minute which is not you know it's understandable um, I wouldn't necessarily do it I think he starts for me against Bayern uh, away and away um, so therefore I'd rest him against Villa um, and if by, by or if, look if he's fit Villa potentially I, I'm I'm less keen on the Villa game because I think we'll have a lot more of the ball um, so I'm more looking at Jorginho and I don't think that's as, as physical a game it's more of a kind of I don't know it, it, I don't know it, it, a lot of it depends on his fitness but I'm looking at games like Tottenham away and United away where I would love Thomas Partey I would absolutely love Thomas Partey I think games like Chelsea at home give Jorginho the ball let him cook um, it's all going to depend on his fitness but yeah I, 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 I think there's certain flashpoints where I go definitely Thomas Partey and then if he proves his fitness and proves his sharpness and, you know, tomorrow night comes out with an unbelievable performance and Mikel says, yep, he's fully fit and far and ready to go, then we're having different conversations. There might only be one or two Jorginho games in this running um, for me. So we'll see. But Which uh, is huge because I don't know. Per- like, I mean, look, I, I love the player. I made no qualms about it. But I think that's a really big part of the run-in yep. if he's able to do huge. it. And look, we'll save that conversation because the pod's really nearing its end points right now. But what does that mean? in terms of the season like there's gonna be questions and i and i have made this point in the pod before i think if if he does it if and he still has to do this i think it's going to raise some important questions about what we do with him because that's a significant part of our season it's a it's a big question and Partey very rarely talks to the media um and he did (laughs) no comment um and he did and he said he's happy at arsenal He's up yeah. at Arsenal, so so yeah. There's a conversation coming down the pipeline about that. Uh, George, I would like you. We'll do one more each after this. Mm. I would like you to do Alexander Zinchenko. Zinchenko, <laughs> a little bit of uh, food for your own medicine, George. Eh? Uh, look, he is a player that I think has lost influence on the team, and um, look, I think he's a player that's always been very specific, generally speaking. Even though last season we really relied upon him as a plan A in terms of what he did for us coming into that pivot, I've always made this point, why does the fullback need to be the double pivot? I've always made this point for over a year. I've said a midfielder can do midfield things too. It doesn't have to be a fullback. Yeah, there's benefits and drawbacks, but it doesn't have to be him. No, and in the same way that it doesn't have to be a midfielder. Like, there are game moments, but the one point that I would make is Urien Timber strikes me as a player that can do both. He is a midfielder, but he also is a fullback. Zinchenko, for me, is a very specific inverted fullback. He can't do the Kivior role as well. He isn't somebody that can do both of those things in games, so you actually have to sub him if you want something different. And that's always been the issue with me with him. I'll end on this. Look at those games. Those are running games, mate. And I, again, look at Bournemouth and potentially Chelsea at home. Everton at home, maybe as well. Maybe. Uh, But again, physical against Onan. Yeah, depends where they are. Depends where they are on the... Yeah, it's a physical team. So I worry, I'll be honest. I think he starts maybe one game and maybe has a sub appearance in two or three more. He's behind... Multiple people. I think he's yeah. behind Yuri and Timber, who's approaching fitness again. Tommy Asu again. We're looking at those one v ones. I'm sorry, Kiv yours provided more sample and done a little bit more in the last nine games. So, yep. again, don't get rid. But there's going to be moments, and I don't think he features as heavily as what we would anticipate. There's games for him. There's 100 percent games for him. There's moments for him. Let's not forget what he is when he when he is in the team. And, and, and can influence things and I think he gives us a flexibility there you know in that sort of second line 
but the timber injury postponed it just, i can't get away from this the timber injury postponed all the conversations we would have had about sinchenko this season yeah we're, we're, we're on borrowed time yep. here we you know this it's like it's like talking about you know it's, it's like talking about a number nine when you signed one in it who got injured in the, in the summer you know we signed awesome and got injured it's like well fine but <laughs> there's an elephant in the room here so yeah there's yeah I, I i i do agree it's just it's a it's a complicated conversation with zinchenko and, and one i think we might have to revisit a few times let's do one more each okay um what about trossard i'll give you trossard trossard Somebody i think you use but. Yeah, is what's nice about Trossard is it, it it feels he's like the perfect squad player, mm. perfect. Can offer you flexibility in a number of different roles. Isn't perfect in terms of you know isn't the maximal you want in every role, but gives everything. Is always available, always impacts games, always uh, you know in terms, in terms of professionalism, in terms of you know what you want from a squad player, gives you everything there. But also is I think fine to play to get twenty appearances, mm. ten starts, to, you know, maybe five starts, fifteen, fifteen sub appearances. You know, I, I, I genuinely think he's probably going look to maximise my career. I've played for Belgium, I've been a starter at a Premier League club. I'm here now. This is a team that that looks like they're about to start winning a lot of stuff. Let me stay here. Let me be a big part of it. Let me leave with couple of Premier League medals and a couple of Champions League medals and go off to Saudi like you know what that's fine is that is that not a good career like it's a really good career so I, I don't think he has that kind of superstar I must be starting gene in him so I think he's the perfect squad player and I think he's going to make a difference in this running not I don't think he'll be the difference maker but I think he'll be a difference that is you know I don't I can't I, maybe I'm wrong but you know he scored in the Porto game but is he the guy who pops up absolutely at the crucial crunch time I don't know but he's going to make an impact is he only going to show fire like yeah, yeah you know and I'm sorry that's really important and look I, I make no qualms I love the player but mate I don't know about you but every time I try to talk about what is Trissard and how has it been his season I look to try to see his output how how insane is his goal and assist yeah it's crazy to per 90 because yeah. it's been beyond consistent it's now been a year and a half of sample and it's kind of always risen but um, yeah, we can't talk much more. I agree with a lot of what you said. Yeah. Um, who do you have for me? And is it a certain hail end? Cedric, Cedric Suarez. Uh, no, it is. <laughs> Prison. Um. Prison FC. <laughs> uh, it's Eddie and Ketia. Oh my goodness. You've given me the boys that just like, you know, kill you in the heart because they're just, <laughs> I, I feel bad for Eddie. Um, because I just feel like he lost the writing was on the wall in terms of the first half of the season compared to the second half of the season. And we all know we're approaching a point now with these two hail enders that I think have had moments that have lost their influence on the squad. And I just see an Eddie, by the way, uh, I don't love the body language. I hate to be that person. Um, <clears throat> but I just feel like in his cameos, he's been running for himself as opposed to the team lately. And there's a part of me that doesn't blame him. I have to hand on heart say I just did what I did in the first half of the season and I did it well and I got discarded and it's a, it's a harsh reality because there's players in front of him that I prefer but on an individual level he wants to start and it's time for him to start playing for a team where he's given that faith of being basically the number one so yeah I'm just looking up the the numbers because there was that obviously that Sheffield United game where he scored a hat trick, and I'm pretty sure he got dropped the next game. Like it, it mm -hmm. just it doesn't it doesn't matter what he does, and and that's the thing. Yeah, he which got, is yeah, why he, he's running for himself. Like I can understand it from an individual level, but yep. you can't do that in the run in. Yep. Sorry, I, he didn't get dropped the next game. He got dropped the the game after. <laughs> so he played against Newcastle one nil, and then, um, yeah. Uh, so you, you scored three goals, and then you're on the bench for Burnley. You're on the bench for Brentford. You're on the bench for Wolves. You're on the bench, and his next start was Fulham. Um, so you know I, he must just look at it and go, look, I've my race is run here. Um, and yeah, let's move forward in the summer, George. We must, we must tie up two loose ends before we go. One, very quickly. Score prediction for tomorrow. Oh, God. Um, 
I'm going to go with a 3-1. I think it'll be goals. I think it'll be blockbuster. I think it'll be cagey. It'll be a very consolation game of transitions. I am going for 2-1 to Arsenal. Because uh, I think we'll lose it. The only answer. Uh, and are Arsenal going to win the Premier League? Yes or no? Get off the fence. Yes. No. Nope. Throw it back to you. Uh, we're moving on. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much I, for being here. Has anything changed for you? Look, at the beginning of the season, I was very secure that City were going to win it and also come second. Right now, I am about as secure as... Um, I haven't got an analogy, but I'm not very secure. <laughs> not very secure, I'll put you that. On the scale of... Am I changing my mind? Where are you right now? Because I know a couple of weeks ago you were like, no, no, City are still winning the league for me. And we've been really good. I'm not changing uh, my crept, mind. Have you crept towards the idea yeah. that it's more of a real possibility? 100%. I haven't changed my mind, but it's it's a lot closer than it ever has been. I think I pinpoint uh, the last sort of three, four games. I think once we get there, and we're at game week 33, 34, not to sound like a new Emery, um, I yeah I, I I will I will be more I will I'm, I'll be willing to cede at that point if we're top of the league and 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 depending on where we are and either way we're baby, here for first folks that's the hard way baby I win <laughs> 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 I'm right or I win baby uh, George a pleasure to chat you as always thank you so much for being here um, and thank you to you for watching thank you for listening uh, you can check out the kind of podcast on Spotify and Apple. Uh, you can check us out on YouTube every Monday for an hour where we post our beautiful, incredible, extraordinary content. We'll be back for um, this reaction tomorrow after the buying game. But until then, thank you so much for being here and peace. Peace.